Hi, welcome to this analysis that we're doing about the top 20 public companies in the world. So today we're going to take a look into one of the most interesting companies in the world. Um, some people think that they dominate a lot of uh, our day-to-day -day life and yet it is a very unknown company and I'm going to explain you why. So, so, so this company is uh, TSMC. That's the name that uh, that's the name that people call call it. Although the largest name is uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Company, and uh, the reason that I'm saying that they are very dominant in our day-to-day -day life is because they are responsible for almost 51% of the global chip market, and in terms of um, consumer electronics like iPhones or electric cars, they provide the chips of almost 92% of these devices. No? So so maybe you, when you look at your cell phone or um, computers or your electronic car, um, the vast majority of these devices um, use products that are produced by TSMC. And um, I'm going to explain you somehow how, how quickly it became one of the largest companies in the world. So the story starts in 1931 with uh, this gentleman, Maurice Chang, and he was born in China. And in the time since 1931 to the time where he got to his student degree, he came back and forth from China to Hong Kong because... Um, the People's Republic of China was in this uh, big war and revolution after the World War II. And um, that's that's how his life was impacted. However, in his family, he has the ability to go to study ha to Harvard by 1949. And by 1952, when he he then changed to, to the MIT and got graduated with an engineering degree at 21 years old, and from there, since 1955, he was hired first by a company called Sylvania Semiconductor, Semiconductor. And then by 1958, at 27 years old, he started this career in the corporate ladder by this famous company, Texas Instruments. No? So Texas Instruments from these 50s and 60s was one of the most important technologies companies in the world. And um, he... He left Texas Instrument after after several years after after several decades. In fact, he was 52 years old when he left it and um, Texas Instrument and as a vice president, vice president for worldwide semiconductor business. So next after that, he became chief operational officer of a company called General Instrument Corporation, and after that he. He left that company and Sun Yuan recruited him to become the chairman and president of of the Industrial Technology Research Institute in Taiwan for the government of Taiwan. So that's how he then started to get um, putting together many people from the Taiwan bureaucracy to question what would be the future of the Taiwan economy. So that's how they, after two years he convinced the people from the Taiwan government and also people from different corporations like Philips to put together their intelligence in the future of semiconductors and that's how they in cooperation with the with the government and with local entrepreneurs they put together kind of a governmental company with private ownership which was this TSMC in 1987 so 1987 it's um, when this company was put together I, and five years later, by 1993, the company was listed in the Taiwan Stock Exchange. And then by 1997, four years later, the company was the first Taiwanese company to be listed in the New York Stock Exchange. So it was just before the bubble or during the bubble of the Internet. This is 1997, the dot-com bubble. So before it was exploding, the company was already in this wave of providing semiconductors, although they started very, very behind in the curve of technology. Um, when the dot-com bubble exploded, then a lot of the companies and chip makers that were involved in this bubble 
got broke, but because um, Taiwan Semiconductor was sponsored by these big companies, Philips, and also by the government of the of Taiwan, they were able to go through these difficulties and uh, take a lot of the market that um, that was in that moment. So sometimes when when a technology bubble uh, gets inflated, there is a lot of speculation about what the future would look like. So there is a lot of innovation and creativity in those bubbles. So, but the problem is there is not probably in that moment technology enough to fill the gap between what people can imagine and what the technology can give. But still the plans are there and the ideas are there. So when these companies um, get bro broken, uh, there is a lot of opportunity to fill the gaps for the companies that have better financial strength and economic shape and technology and they can absorb companies that went broke or their assets or their technology and keep developing them. So that's what happened with um, with TSMC that we were in this uh, brink of the development of, for instance, the tablets. I remember IBM had their tablets and they were with the iPads um, um, in this uh, struggle of putting them into the market, also BlackBerry, I remember. So in this um, gap that happened because of the explosion of the dot-com bubble is where TSMC became stronger in the market. No? And then by 2011, the company planned to increase their research and development expenditures by almost 39%. So they, they were, they started this um, relationship with Apple in 2011 to produce um, the A5 SOC and the A6 SOC for the Apple's iPad and iPhone devices. And that's how they began to get more and more of the market of chips for most of the technology that we use nowadays. No? Um, by 2014, I, ARM and TSMC announced a new multi-year agreement for the development of ARM-based ARM 10NM processors. So Maurice Chang retired in 2018. Let's let's look at the financial statements or at least this slide that I like a lot. So right now the chief executive officer of TSMC is Mr. CC Wei. And see let's look at, at this company. The business model, since their business is to provide the chips for for the big brands that we use. So they just focus in having few customers. So for instance, in 2010, they used to have 450 customers. And by 2020, they only increased this number of customers by 10%, by 13%. And now they, in 2020, they reported they have only 510 customers, see? And in average, the products that they put per customer before was 18 products, and now they produce 23 products, no? So every customer has an average volume. See, this is where it is very interesting. When they provide this new technology for their products of the customers, what they say is our business is based on ethics and we will never ever launch our own products. So for instance, Apple that depends on the, on the technology that is developed by TSMC are sure that TSMC will never launch a iPhone or a competitor for the for the iPhone, and that was that's what make a very strong relationship between them and TSMC. And for instance, if you have Nvidia or another company that produces um, GPUs or specific technology, they have this. Uh, they are sure that they are not going to share this technology that they are developing for a specific customer to pass it to somewhere else. So that's something that is very, very strong in the in the brand of TSMC. Ethics is very important in this business model. And I think that's what makes them be every time more and more reliable for their customers, see? And that can be seen because what they didn't grow in number of customers, they did grow in value, see? Because you, we can see here in 2010, every customer had a value of more or less $40 million. But by 
2020, in general, their customers have put more and more value added into the process that TSMC managed for them. So now every contract is more or less $100 million per year for each of them, of course. Some will be very small and some will be dramatically high. No? So that's the driver is this confidence of the customers that put into the hands of TSMC to handle and also the ability to increase the average products that they handle for every customer. So they have to do these giga factories to handle all this uh, production for their customers. And they have to be very, very efficient to provide these products with very high technology, but also in very high volume, which makes them like um, very, very valuable for their customers. No? So for instance here, total revenues have increased massively in 10 years because in 2010, they used to produce $17 billion of sales, and now they produce almost $50 billion of sales. No? But, and look at the expense that they do in research and development. Before it was $1.2 billion 10 years ago, and by 2020, they are almost $4 billion of only research and development, which we have to be very careful because sometimes companies use account accounting strangely to put expenses that don't correspond necessarily to research and development, it's very difficult to determine if this is true or not. However, since these companies, everybody talks very well about them, about their ethics, I think it's something that could be reliable. See what is the payoff of the net of, of the increase in the research and development expense. Net profits went from six billion to eighteen billion, threefold in ten years, no? And I also like a lot the way that this company is financing almost two thirds of their total assets correspond to shareholders equity, meaning that the company every time is accumulating uh, profits, no? which makes their capital structure stronger and stronger every time. And their total debt, although it has increased from 2 billion to 12 billion, it's not in a difficult situation for the company. And you can see how the company has increased its property and equipment almost three times from 15 billion to 55 billion. No? So I like I like a lot this company because of the ethics, because of the investment in technology. And I think it's clearly a very successful um, story of it is never late to start a very interesting company which provides a lot of value to society. So. Uh, thumbs up to Mr. Morris Chang. I like his story a lot and I think it's of a lot of inspiration for many places that think that that um, not everything is written. No? So thank you very much and I hope you appreciate this video and have a great day.